Merry Christmas, everyone. I hope you've all had a wonderful day. You know, tonight's video is extra special. Three years ago, I made a special Christmas collaboration between me, Killer Orange Cat, and Being Scared. Sadly, Being Scared couldn't make it to this one because of other commitments. But me and Killer Orange Cat are here for 10 true creepy Christmas horrors. There are even more horrors over on his channel as well, so be sure to head on over there when you're done here to keep on listening. The stories are pretty good. And you know what would make my Christmas personally? Is subscribing to Killer Orange Cat. He has been my friend and mentor for the past five years at least. He helped me grow my channel when no one else would, and his friendship has always meant a lot to me. He is only a few thousand subs away from hitting 40,000. And like I said, it would really, really, really mean a lot to me if you would give him a chance and maybe give him a sub. Thanks guys. But for now, it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. Personally, the last half of 2017 has been pretty exhausting. The most draining part, both emotionally, physically, and financially, has been the laborious task of moving my father into an aged care facility due to his rapidly advancing dementia. He lives in Tasmania where I grew up, and I'm currently working and living in Brisbane, which is about 1,500 miles away, north of Tasmania. I have been making three and a half hour flights down to Tasmania about twice a month to sort out my dad's situation. I have been busying myself by fixing up his empty dilapidated home in order to get it ready to be sold. I moved out all of his furniture and belongings, save for a pile of blankets and pillows that I turned into a makeshift bed on the floor while I'm visiting. The house is situated in a semi-rural area, surrounded by overgrown trees and bushes. It's an old house, damp, everything creaks, and there's currently no electricity, which is very creepy during the night. The house itself is not very secure. With no security system, the doors have locks, but a forceful nudge will pop them open. I flew in on Christmas Eve in the late evening, picked up my hire car to make the hour long drive down to the house. I stopped in at a mate's place who lives about 10 minutes away from my dad to have a few beers and chat about the year that had just passed. After a few hours, I realized I had probably surpassed the legal blood alcohol limit to drive. My mate's legendary wife dropped me off at my dad's and offered to come back in the morning to pick me up and go back to their place to get my car. A Christmas miracle. I entered my dad's house around midnight. The house inside was pitch black and in my slightly drunken state, I flipped the light switch and nothing happened. Oh yeah, <laughs> no power, right. Using my phone as a light to navigate my way through the house, over the creaky floorboards, I noticed that some of the tools that I had left laying around the house had been stolen. I sighed and accepted the fact that it was my own stupid fault for leaving them out in an unsecure house. Some kids probably noticed that no one is living there and took advantage of the situation. It was unsettling knowing that someone had been there, but I didn't bother calling the police over a hammer, wrench and screwdriver that came to a grand total of about $16. Good news was the big toolbox, which I kept locked up in the laundry cupboard that houses the more expensive power tools was still there and intact. I studied the padlock and the space around it, and it looked pretty scratched up and dented, like someone had crudely attempted to prise it open. Nice try, morons, I said aloud to myself. The toolbox is very big and heavy and too big for one person to carry unless you're Andre the Giant. Exhausted, I went into one of the furnitureless rooms and made my makeshift bed out of blankets and pillows. I couldn't get comfortable, and it was taking me a while to drift off to sleep. As I was laying there, the only sound I could hear over the ringing of my tinnitus was the gentle rustling of leaves and the wind through the trees. I could also hear what sounded like the unmistakable crunch of boots on gravel that went up the side of the house. I tried to listen harder when there was a loud gong sound of something solid coming in contact with the metal railing that leads up to the back door. This made me sit up wide-eyed while my heart races. 
Maybe it was a wallaby or possum. I sit there. It's possible. I was just listening. I could hear the sounds of trees in the wind and nothing else for a few moments, and then I start to calm down. This was interrupted by the pop and squeak of the back door being pushed open. Crap. Now I freeze. Not knowing what to do, I could hear footsteps creaking through the back of the house, and I hear the laundry cupboard being opened. I was at the other end of the hallway, but I could hear whispers. The only words that I could make out were, There. Shh. Quick. I pull myself together, pull out my phone and call the police. I chat to the dispatcher while burying my head under the pillow and muffling my voice. I explain the situation to the dispatcher, and says that the police are on their way. While this is happening, I can hear a chink sound of what I'm assuming was the lock of the toolbox trying to be broken. The dispatcher suggests that I lock the door of the room I'm in. I agree, and I slowly pad over across the room to the door. One of the floorboards creaks so loudly. I freeze and hear dead silence from the laundry room. They must have heard. After about 30 seconds of standing still, I try to take another step and get yet another high-pitched creak. But this seems to work in my favour, because my new house guests scatter away out the back door. I lock the bedroom door, tell the dispatcher that I think they've gone, and she tells me to stay put until the police arrive, and I tell her that I'm more than happy to comply. After about five minutes, the cops arrive, and the dispatcher bids me farewell. The police did a search of the area, but as expected, found nothing. They had tried to break open the toolbox. One of the cops says, why didn't they just use bolt cutters, amateurs, and we all have a laugh. I explained to the police about how when I came home, some of the tools that I had left lying around were stolen, and that the toolbox looked like it had already been attempted to be broken into. Upon hearing that, the other cops started his theory of how the events took place. They probably broke in earlier tonight before you got there, grabbed what they could, tried to open the toolbox, but couldn't, and then left to go get something else to open it with. While they were gone, you came home, and they arrived back here to open the toolbox. I doubt they were dangerous, probably just kids. Good timing, I think to myself. I made the report, and that was that. I stayed up until sunrise, then decided to get a couple of hours sleep until my mate's wife came to pick me up and collect my car. I ask if I can keep my tools at their place for safekeeping, to which they agree. I drove down to my dad's old folks' home and had Christmas lunch with him and his new elderly buddies. The following day, I go to a hardware store and purchase some new, sturdier door locks. As I started decorating my tree, I pick up this angel ornament that we got to honor and represent my grandpa who passed away 12 years ago. As I look at it, it reminds me of something crazy that happened three years ago. The tree that the angel is sitting on in the picture was brand new at the time. The three years previous to getting this tree, we had horrible luck. Something always went wrong with our Christmas trees. It was so bad that we were at the point that we could no longer be bothered buying another one. Black Friday rolled around, and there were some really good deals on trees. We talked about getting one, and were very unsure about spending any more money on trees. We ultimately decided there was no better time to get one, and decided to test our luck one last time. We swore up and down that if something happened with this one, we were done with Christmas trees. The one in the picture is the one we got that day. We brought it home and started setting it up. Once we got all the layers put together and made sure all the lights on each layer were attached, we plugged it in. Once again, bad luck struck. The top layer was lit and so was the bottom but there were no lights in the middle. We spent an hour and a half, almost two hours, trying to fix it. We did absolutely everything we could, and we could not get the lights to come on. We ultimately gave up and decorated the tree anyways. I picked up my grandpa's angel, and I placed it on the unlit part of the tree. The exact moment it touches the tree, and I mean, the exact moment 
the lights come on. We were in shock. We couldn't believe it. I know it might seem like a coincidence, but I truly believe my grandpa was there with us. We've had a few other experiences that were, without a doubt, him. This happened back on Christmas Eve in 1999, when I was 12 years old. My parents were away at a Christmas party and planned not to return till late, probably after midnight. So it was just me and my brother John, who was 16 at the time. I was a dumb kid who still believed that Santa was real. Approaching midnight, I decided to go to bed. Just about three hours after, I hear a knock at the front door. I thought it was my parents coming back from the party, or perhaps Santa. But then I thought and realized something. I was like, Santa comes through the chimney, not the front door. And couldn't my parents just open the garage and come in? My parents never ever tell anyone who was outside our family what the garage code is. Plus nobody else but them were expected to come to the house for the night. I decided to just ignore it. At least five minutes later, I hear a knocking noise again. This time I decide to check who the hell is knocking at 3am. I made sure to check the front door from the window to the kitchen, so that whoever was knocking on the door could see me. The kitchen window that I was viewing from was across left of where the door was, so you could only see the person's right side if they were facing the door. From what I could see there was a man dressed up as Santa Claus, but I was not able to see his face due to the fact that he was facing the front of the door. He then suddenly turned around to face me. He seemed to be somewhere between his early 50s to late 40s. He was grinning a massive, creepy grin, and then said, Merry Christmas, Joseph. I have some presents down here for you. Why don't you come and open the door and let good old Saint Nick give them to you? I was scared and said nothing. Then he started to jiggle the doorknob to get in. I quickly walked to my brother's bedroom to alert him about the fake Santa Claus. He was grumpy that I had woken him up, and when we went to check, there was no one there. He accused me of dreaming. Go back to bed, Joe. But he is. No buts. He was annoyed. I went back to bed but couldn't go back to sleep. Then I heard it again. This time I ran down the stairs, busted into my brother's room and screamed that he was still there. Angry now that I could not go back to sleep, me and him walked up the stairs and looked at the kitchen window. But this time we both saw him and he was like, Oh my, you're right Joe, sorry I didn't believe you. We hid in my bedroom as he dialed 911. The police said that they would be there as soon as possible. Eight to ten minutes later, no noise was made and it was all quiet. I was about to ask my brother if he thought the creep was gone when all of a sudden we heard a window break. We quickly looked at each other in horror as we realized the creep had broken the window to get in. We heard boots approaching my bedroom and the words, Joseph, where are you? I have a Christmas present for you. Come see St. Nicholas, which freaked both of us out. There were blue and red and white flashing lights and the police were finally here. It felt like forever. He tried to escape from the window he broke through, but the police caught him. The window he broke was the kitchen window that I was looking out of. The man was a convicted rapist who had done something terrible to a 12 year old boy just a few blocks away. After that, my parents never went to another holiday party. I answered the phone at my job, and now the customer thinks I'm his wife. And this happened about a year ago. Everything was spread out over a couple of months. I'm on a mobile phone, so sorry if there's things that are wrong. I'm known for being a very smiley, bubbly, and social girl. Okay, here's my experience. At the time this happened, I was the only person who did to-go orders answered all phones and customer questions, as well as greeting and cashing out to go or delivery orders. It was mid-December, 
And where I live, we have a massive Christmas festival and tree lighting. So at the time I was getting multiple phone calls asking if we would be open or had any specials, etc. I answered the phone and the typical script was blah 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 blah. He was nice, but after I answered his questions about a restaurant, he started asking questions about me. Age, how long I worked there, if I was from where the restaurant was located. I felt weird and made an excuse that if he didn't have any more questions about the restaurant, I needed to go. He told me I sounded beautiful and he couldn't wait to meet me. It bothered me a little, but I soon forgot about it. Jump forward to a few weeks. The festival is here and we're busy. I'm helping in all aspects of the restaurant, and our bartender comes and grabs me and tells me a man at her table wanted to speak to me. Me, thinking it was a compliment, I told her okay and put my best customer service smile on and went over. Me. Hi everyone, I hope everything is okay here, but I heard from our wonderful bartender that one of you wanted to speak with me. John, staring, my god, you're as beautiful as I dreamed you'd be. It's the guy you spoke to a few weeks ago. You were so amazing, and I just loved you since then. Me, visibly freaked. Oh, haha, <laughs> thank you. Is there anything else the matter? John. No. I just had to see what my new wife looked like. Me. Oh well. I've gotta go. Y'all have a great night. I walked away a little nervous, but then soon got distracted. The bartender comes over and tells me John wants to say goodbye. So I give a smile and a wave that was not good enough. He comes to me arms open and wants a hug. I awkwardly smile and try to give a distant side hug. Not good enough. He grabs my shoulders, causing me to face forward and gives me a really tight and hard hug. The night's over and I ignore my uneasy feelings. I end up becoming sick for a couple days. I come back and my manager comes to speak with me and tells me that John has called the restaurant around 56 times and would only want to speak to me. As we're discussing this, the bartender tells me, someone wants to speak to me on the phone. I go behind the bar and answer, guess who? It's John, telling me he loved seeing me and couldn't wait for us to get married. I hung up. My manager and I decided to block the number. I finished my shift and start walking to my car. I noticed a car weirdly in the parking lot. I giggle and ignore it. The car was pulling up and said something. I'm not paying attention and don't hear them. Then I get into my car and start replying to texts. I notice the same car is now parked beside me. The window is cracked so I can see that they are facing me but can't tell much else. The car then pulls up to each side of my car and stares at me from each side for about five minutes or so. I notice it's John, so I'm scared. I was too scared to drive off thinking he would follow me. The only thing I could think of is call my job. Four guys come sprinting out of the back with knives and the car drives off. We don't have cameras in our parking lot. I'm really crappy, I know. They call me down and I drive home, watching everything around me. That night, my phone started acting extremely weird, shutting on and off, out of control as in apps are opening even though I haven't touched them and has never happened before. I decided to shut my phone off completely, knowing I had another option of calling someone if need be. I wake up in the next morning feeling nervous. I get ready for work and head out to my car. As I'm pulling away, I notice something on the side of my house. I go up to it and see it's two pocket knives. One appeared to have blood on it. The other was above my head, 
so I had to step back and notice the second knife was stabbed into a picture. I notice it's a picture of me at a store shopping. I was done. I called the police. They took my statement and went through the whole process you have to go through when reporting something like this. To make a long story short, a bit shorter, two other scary things that happened were pictures taken of me at random times and areas were thrown all over my deck and a note left on my car at work that said, Hi pretty, love you. The paper looked like it was soaked in blood. It was fake. So now the number is blocked. Everyone in my restaurant knows what this man looks like. I get walked in and out of my job by a male manager or a co-worker. I have cameras everywhere and weapons. I hate having to do this, but it's for my protection. Nothing has happened for a bit. I just figured others would find this interesting. Or maybe it's happening to someone else, and it makes them feel less alone. But hey, John, let's never meet again. I have been working at a restaurant for about eight months now. My first job there was as a busser. I worked very hard and made a lot of friends because I did favors for everyone. I would help other people do their job. I would come in early and stay late. And almost every day that I worked there, I would throw out all the garbage. Needless to say, it didn't take long for my managers to notice and they started to promote me. After three months of working there, I became a coach for the new buses that they would hire. This is when we met John. We had got a fresh crop of new buses, and it was up to me to get them up to speed. John stood out from the rest only because of how absolutely terrible he was at doing his job. I mean, it's hard work, but it's very simple concepts, really. Pick up dirty dishes and plates and cups, throw away the garbage, wipe down seats and tables, then reset the table, and needless to say, he was very bad at this simple task, if he even attempted it at all. A lot of the time he would just walk by dirty tables and ignore the mess until someone told him to buss it. I worked with him as much as I could, but he had a permanent scowl and I'm too good for this job air about him. It didn't take long for every one of our staff to hate this kid. It was to the point where people dreaded working the same shift as him. As for me, I knew he was terrible, but I'm a nice guy and I knew that all I had to do was say the word and he would be gone. But instead, I figure he needed work like the rest of us. The final straw was about two months ago. Side note, our restaurant is the busiest sports bar in the state and would normally schedule three to four buses along with three to four hosts on a single night. But we would all split the tip money and walk out with around 80 to 100 each. That being said, I was bussing with John who was terrible and a new kid with no training. So I'm in overdrive work mode. I'm not talking to anyone and my feet are a blur. I'm bussing 10 tops in and about one minute flat down to the wood. The dishwasher is running slow, so I'm running to the back and starting washing silverware. Garbage starts piling up and I'm running a mountain of trash to the dump in record time, then right into mopping spills. I hadn't noticed at this point that the other buses were missing. So now my manager is on the floor helping me bus because I'm falling behind. I thought, Screw it, we're crashing and burning, might as well find out what these guys are up to now. I check every nook and cranny of the restaurant. No one has seen these guys for the past 45 minutes. My manager is pissed at me, which really is the hardest part for me. So I was like, screw it, let me check in the parking lot. Lo and behold, I find John and the new kid smoking weed in between some cars. I grabbed the new kid by a shirt collar, took him aside and I said, if you want to keep this job, get inside right now and help me out. Me and the new kid went inside and John followed behind us. That night while closing, my managers asked me why I was slacking that night. I responded with explaining that John was distracting the new kid by trying to get him to smoke during our dinner rush, but the new kid knew better. I lied because I liked the new kid and I thought he deserved a real shot like everyone else. The next day, Jay was fired and everyone knew why. I got him fired. It's Christmas Eve, last night. And it was a normal Hispanic Christmas Eve, drinking, dancing, dominoes, and smoking cigars. 
It's about 10.45 and I am smashed. The only people standing at this point was my grandmother, who's a party machine, me along with my girlfriend, and my uncle and brothers all down just chilling on the couch when I get a text. The area code was from my area, but I didn't recognize the number. I open up the text and see, Hey bro, it's John. I'm a Basarat, you know. I was wondering if you're over 21. Yeah, I'm closer to 30 than I am 21. Oh cool. Do you want to buy me a bottle? I'm not old enough yet. Uh, sure, whatever, where are you at? Oh, I'm just driving around. Text me your address, I'll come by and pick you up. It was at this point that I got really confused about who I was talking to. John got fired and I didn't know any other buses called John. The liquor store's on the corner of this street and this street. Now nah, man, your exact address, I'll swing by and get you. At this point, the red flags were up now and I was thinking of ways to end the conversation without looking like a dick. Hey John, I just googled all the liquor stores in the area. They're all closed up early for Christmas. Nah dude, I found a 24 hour one. I'm in your part of town, I'll pick you up. At this point, I was sobering up real quick. I didn't live anywhere near work. And I know that the John who used to work with me for three weeks had no clue where I lived, or so I thought. I showed my girlfriend the text and she agreed it was super creepy. And I called my friends from work and they confirmed that there were no new buses named John. So it had to be the one they fired. Then the dude calls me up. Yo bro, let me come get you real quick. I know this place in this part of town that has a 24 hour store. Uh, let me just call them up real quick, just to make sure that we don't waste the gas. All right, call me right back. I hung up, blocked his number. Looking back on it, so many things could have gone wrong. I'm pretty sure he was out for some kind of petty vengeance, maybe more. But I'm glad I didn't find out. Certainly would have ruined Christmas. A creeper got his karma. This happened a few years ago. Before I met my husband, I came home after graduating college and I met a guy at a bar. His name was Matt and he was a friend of my friend Kevin. I was hanging out with Kevin one night when I got to talking to Matt. He seemed cool and asked me out. I agreed to go to dinner with him the following weekend. Matt picked me up and we went out to dinner. Dinner was nice, but a little boring. He then took me back to his house so he could get something before we went to the bar. He took me into his disgusting house. He had 18 cats and you could smell the house before you walked in and left me in the living room with his mom while he dug around in his room for whatever he was looking for I still didn't know. His mom asked me my name and then started asking me questions, saying she wanted to get to know her future daughter-in-law. When he came out of his room, she started gushing at him about how pretty, smart, and how much of an improvement I was, and that he picked a great girl to marry. It had been ten minutes. We went to the bar and had a decent time although I was a bit creeped out. He took me home and everything was fine. I texted him the next day and told him that, although I had a nice time, I wasn't really feeling a spark and offered that we could be friends. It was summer and I texted that before I got in the pool. When I got out of the pool, I had 70 missed calls, 8 Facebook messages, and six texts of paragraphs from Matt asking me to give him another chance to show me what a great guy he is. I told him I was firm on my decision and then blocked his Facebook and his number. That evening, my friend Joe came over. Joe had a blue truck. I got a text from a number that I didn't know saying, Who's in the blue truck? Is it your boyfriend? I didn't respond. This happened numerous times, and he somehow kept texting me from different numbers. I was watched for about a week, asking all about my comings and goings, my outfits, etc. I could never find him when I looked, even in my small development. 
I called the police and they couldn't find him either. They told me that in our state, unless he was physically harming me, there was nothing they could do. Things died down and I didn't hear from him for a while. I guess after not responding to anything for so long. On Christmas Eve, I was enjoying time with my family and there was a knock at my door. My now husband answered the door and Matt, standing at the door, turned white as a sheet. He had a card and a bottle of vodka, which he shoved at my now husband and then left. The card said, I think it's time to reconnect and for you to give me another chance. The seal on the bottle was broken, so he poured it down the sink in case there was something funky in it. On New Year's Eve, my now husband had to work, so I went out with a girlfriend to a local bar. Matt was at a New Year's Eve party, and he had had a lot to drink. Someone at the party was friends with my girlfriend on Facebook and told him that we tagged ourselves at a bar, and that my now husband wasn't tagged. Matt then decided that he was going to come find me. Needless to say, Matt wrapped his car around a tree, doing 65 miles per hour on a back road in the snow, drunk off his ass. When he was arrested, he mentioned me by name and told the cops he was coming to find me. Turns out Matt had a pill problem and was wanted in another state for felony possession and writing bad checks. Matt's in jail, and that's how a creeper got his karma. When I was in high school, I wasn't a very hard-working student. I wasn't a troublemaker, but I was an incredibly lazy girl, working just the minimum so that my parents wouldn't get angry. I've always had some kind of easiness regarding schoolwork, and never knew what it truly meant to make an effort. So I spent all my classes drawing or copying books without many consequences. My junior year of maths, my teacher, who was seen as everyone as uptight but very caring, was pretty upset about this, as were many of my previous teachers. He wanted me to work harder. I wasn't bad at maths. I was around a grade B, but sometimes my grades would dip. During my parent-teacher meetings, he told my mum that I was wasting my capacities and that it was infuriating how lazy I was. My mum then replied that she agreed with him and that she wouldn't blame him for pushing me harder and for pushing me if it meant making me work harder. And from that day on, he did exactly what she said. In every maths class, I would always be the first person to be questioned. He would also make sure that during the tests, he'd push me and say, you can do it, Elisa. It made me feel quite uncomfortable because at that age, no one wants to be the center of anyone's attention. My classmates started to realize that my maths teacher was a little too obsessed with me and teasing me a lot about this. The last class before Christmas break, the maths teacher threw a little surprise Christmas party. It was very nice, him giving us chocolates and mock champagne. We had a lot of fun. And during the party, he poured me another glass of mock champagne, telling me that I deserved it because I was doing better. And it was true, because of all the attention, I was forced to work harder, so my grades were being pushed to about an A. I accepted, but didn't drink it entirely, as I have diabetes and had already had way too much chocolate. But during the next class, I was feeling quite ill, almost faint, and finished my last day of school before Christmas in the nurse's office. At that time, I wouldn't even think it was because of the alcohol-free champagne. I thought it was due to my diabetes that I indeed did have too much chocolate, even if it didn't look like my usual crisis. A few weeks later, my class threw some kind of charity event. It was a class project and we were very proud. In my country, we don't have proms, so it was our occasion to wear formal clothes and dance together at school. The maths teacher was invited and was helping some of the boys to tend the bar. He served me an alcohol-free cocktail, but before I could drink it, a classmate of mine called Flora poured some vodka into it, even though it was forbidden to bring alcohol to school. I was mad because of my diabetes, I couldn't drink alcohol, so I told her that she could just throw the cocktail away. At the time, I thought she did, but when I think about it, I wonder 
if she chose to not waste the alcohol and opted to drink it herself instead. The event ended pretty badly because of the alcohol Flora had bought. Some guys were very drunk and they started breaking things and Flora passed out because of the alcohol she had. The event ended, Flora had been admitted to hospital and was in a coma. It was pretty severe and we spent the next day at school being lectured. Flora actually got expelled from school and never went again. I was very upset with her. Because of her, every event would now be forbidden and our projects were a failure. We gave a very bad image to the association that we were raising funds for. So I kind of ghosted her and never asked her if she was doing any better. I feel bad about it now, but at the time I was immature. But because of that, I'll never know if she was ill because of the alcohol or because of my cocktail. A few weeks later, I failed a maths test. It had been a long time since I'd failed a maths test and my maths teacher was angry. He yelled at me in front of everyone saying how much of a disappointment I was and that I was hopeless, that I would just end up living in a cardboard box under a bridge. Something was off, I was feeling it. He had a very weird look in his eye. It chilled me and I couldn't help it and I started crying. He calmed down a bit and said he would give me an hour of detention during which I would copy my lesson. I was a bit surprised because normally detention is for bad behavior, not for bad grades. But I was a little relieved because it was a small punishment. My parents would never know. I lived quite far from high school and there were buses only every hour. And because of that, even if I finished a class at four, I could never be home before five. And when I got in detention between four or five, my parents would never know. But then when he officially gave me the detention hour, he said that he wanted to be personally present during it and that the only possible hour was 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. I was nervous as I knew that meant I'd have to tell my parents and they'd know everything. As I said earlier, I wasn't a troublemaker, so I first planned to go to detention. But during the day, my friend and I spoke about it and I was feeling more rebellious. So I decided not to tell my parents that I was in detention and that one of my friends would pick me up at six and drive me home. At 5 p.m. when heading towards the detention room, I was angry, mumbling that it wasn't fair to be in detention because of one bad grade. And when I arrived, I realized I was the only one waiting. I then realized that I would be the only student there, alone with that maths teacher who was a little obsessive. And it was getting dark. It was late winter. And it was a big note for me. And when I saw him coming, I panicked and said, sorry, I have an emergency. I have to go now. I'll email the school for rescheduling the detention and ran off. He started to yell at him and said that I had to obey him and go to detention and that he would call my parents. But I didn't care. I knew something was up. I sprinted towards the bus stop and caught my bus and made it home. I was afraid that he'd ring my parents, so when I arrived, I was shaken, but my parents greeted me normally, so I assumed that he never did. He never came back the next day, nor in the next few weeks. Eventually, I learned that he actually quit his position in the school. A shrink came during an hour to ask us if we ever wanted to talk about the maths teacher. But as no one knew what was going on, we didn't have much to say, so the shrink left and we never heard from him again. Until a few months ago. I became a teacher, how ironic, given my laziness when I was a teen. And one day chatting with my coworker, I mentioned his name, talking about my weird, bizarre maths teacher and how I skipped a detention hour. And one of my oldest coworkers went very pale hearing his name. In fact, a few days after the detention hour incident, my maths teacher was arrested for having downloaded some videos from the dark web and some kind of snuff movies starring children and young teens. Maybe this detention hour was just a detention hour and I would have gotten out of it without any issues. But now I'll never know. And I've always wondered what would have happened if I'd have stayed there with him and hadn't have caught my bus. And sorry, Flora, maybe I was the reason that you were expelled. The spirit in my house that likes to decorate for Christmas. My family and I have been dealing with what seems to be poltergeist activity in the home we're renting. Occasionally, we will see figures, hear voices, etc. What intrigues me the most is sometimes strange things that occur 
such as walking into my kitchen to find every cabinet is wide open, as well as everything plugged into an outlet is unplugged. December 1st comes around, and I pull the Christmas tree out of storage and begin assembling it, but I haven't added the ornaments yet. At that time, I was very tired due to lack of sleep, so I took a nap. After waking up, I walked out into the living room, and I realized that there was one ornament hung in the center of my tree. I got chills because my parents were on a work trip, and I was home alone. Maybe they like the holidays. I think it's pretty wholesome, but creepy nonetheless. I'm going to take you back in time to the year 2007, when I was 16. Picture a Norman Rockwell-esque suburban family. Parents, three kids, a yard and a dog, in a blink and you'll miss it, in the USA. One random day, a neighbour of ours has a mild dispute with another neighbour. As a totally warranted response, everyone's favourite neighbour, Mr. Samson, takes every hose he has and floods the other's yard. A solid decision leads to a solid consequence, so naturally he was fined for water waste. My parents run the water in our small town in the USA, and because Mr. Sampson lived a block away from us, he decided to drive over to the water district, shouting that he is an acquaintance of my parents. Second solid decision of many to come from Mr. Sampson. Absolutely no one takes kindly to name droppers, so tuck that gem away under your life facts. My parent comes in and tells him that even if his kid did this, they would still have the same repercussions, gracefully glossing over the fact that other than maybe driving by one another, none of us have ever had an interaction with Mr. Samson. Mr. Samson repeats the name of the man working the front desk as well as my parent's name and claims it's now personal and storms out. My family members and I begin to see Mr. Sampson at random places, constantly the DMVs, the grocery stores, our respective jobs. Apparently, when you're cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs and your parents pay for your house, you have all kinds of time to stalk. It went from random sightings while out and about to phone calls, the cliche 90s types calls of breathing and hanging up. I can see you variety. At this point, Mr. Sampson was more of an annoyance than scary, but as I've stated, when you underestimate crazy, you lose every time. Mr. Sampson began parking across from our house, staying from 6pm to 4am, literally sitting in his car blasting music just staring at the house. Fool must have had the determination and bladder of a racehorse, because who the hell sits out there for 10 hours? His music was trash too, maybe he was a masochist into self-harm seeing how long he could suffer through terrible music and a full bladder. I doubt anyone with a semi-rational concept of social interaction would fathom why. This went on from three to four times a week to a nightly occurrence. Imagine being a 16 year old female that doesn't even feel comfortable to change in her room because of the prospect he might see through the blind somehow, trying to sleep knowing he's out there. We were prisoners in our own home. He began to get bolder, Mr. Sampson drove his car speeding and up onto the sidewalk at my sibling and her partner while they were on the sidewalk, out front coming home from a date. They both had to physically jump out the way to avoid being hit. He made lewd gestures at me when I brought my dog out for a walk and was waiting for my sibling to come and join us. It was so bad I ended up crying and going inside. This has been going on for a year at this point. The cops always said the same thing. There's nothing we can do unless there's a threat made against you or someone is harmed. My parents confronted Mr. Sampson in the street, being tired of his nonsense and asking him what the hell he's doing after my incident, to which Mr. Sampson called the cops and they came asking why we were harassing and threatening him. I will never understand why the system waits until you're a victim rather than prevent someone from being victimized. Almost two years in and it's Christmas time. My parent has a brain aneurysm. Fortunately, they made it through without any lingering effects, which is extremely rare. I convinced my other parent, who had been living at the hospital with their sick partner, to come home and shower and eat. About 9pm, we get a knock at the door. 
A random man in ratty clothes holding a Christmas present says that he's there to deliver it to family name. We ask who sent it and he says that he can't say. We ask who he works for and he shoves the gift at my parents and leaves. We're obviously uncomfortable to open it. My parents decide they need to know what it is. They open it. Inside is a 17 page document of the grounds why Mr. Sampson is suing my parent that was currently in the hospital. Even I could tell it was fake with the grammatical errors and typos. Mr. Sampson took the time to sit and type this up himself thinking it would scare us. The document and fake detail he put in did not. The fact that this 40 something year old man was so fixated on our family that he sat and typed 17 pages of fake documents did scare us. Things progressed and Mr. Sampson began pacing in front of his car and pretending to have a phone call where he talked about punching my parents down the stairs or knowing where the kids went to school and worked and how easy it would be to access us at any time. At the time, I worked a closing shift that led off about 1am. He would be parked next to my car and follow me home. One time I even tried to make random roads and he still stayed straight behind me pulling up to the house with Mr. Samson parked across the street. Think a neighborhood street with cars a good five feet away from each other and having to get out and run to the door. It was a nightmare. We were all exhausted from not only the aneurysm scare but also living and looking over our shoulder. My parents friend told her friend who is a district attorney about the situation. She called and came over and took our case pro bono. Testifying was a wild ride. We had to put in official statements prior to being called to the stand. We were not allowed to be in the room where a family member was testifying, nor were we allowed to talk in the halls as we waited for our turn. Imagine reliving two plus years of traumatic experiences, being cross examined where you're made out to be a liar and then not able to have your family comfort to support you afterwards was not ideal. There was enough to put him away for a year and a half, as well as grant a felony restraining order. We moved while he was still incarcerated. My sister passed while he was in prison. He immediately tried to sue her estate as she was 21 at her death when he was released. He claimed that her testimony from him running up the car at her and her partner was false and the only reason he was locked up, not the real case as there were harassment and stalking charges and that the money people donated to a GoFundMe for her accident he was entitled to. There are so many more details but this was already long enough. So let's not meet Mr. Samson. Let's never ever meet again. You made us prisoners in our own home. Clearly you're still the same and have not learned a thing from your time locked up. Don't talk to strangers. A few years ago on Christmas Eve, my friend Frank and I were driving around. I'm pretty sure we were just getting some last minute shopping done. At one point, we stopped by CVS to get some cards. By this time, it was pretty dark outside. On our way out, we were stopped by a heavy set woman who was waiting by the entrance. She asked if there was any way we could give her a ride down the street. Now, under normal circumstances, I would immediately say no and come up with some excuse about how I need to be somewhere ASAP. I just don't let random strangers in my car. This world is too crazy now. But given that it was Christmas Eve, and it was snowing pretty hard, I decided to help. She got in the back seat, and said she lived down the street not even five minutes away. Before I headed in that direction, I drove across the street to the bank. Not that I needed to inform her, but while I was at the ATM drive through I was just explaining that I needed to get some money out and then we'll head towards her home. That's when shit got awkward real fast. She asked me if I'd be able to let her borrow some money until she gets paid. I glanced over at Frank real quick, who looked like he wanted to just start cracking up. But he held it in. We literally picked this lady up two minutes ago, and she's asking to borrow money as if she's a friend? All I could say was, excuse me? But she just asked again like it was no big deal. 
I followed up by asking her how I would get my money back with no contact info. Then she replied by saying she gave me her cell phone number, but that is shut off right now, and it'll be back on next week. Did she honestly think I was going to believe this crap? So I took another 20 out of the ATM. I definitely wasn't going to give it to her, but I put it in my wallet and told her I would give her the money when we got to her house. Once we were on the main road, I asked her for directions, but she decided to change her mind. She didn't want to go home anymore. Instead, she wanted to go to a friend's house. This was getting too suspicious, and I really just wanted to pull over and tell her to get the hell out of my car. But I kept driving and following her directions. Wherever she took us was far out of my way. It was about 15 minutes from the original destination, and it was mostly side roads that we were taking. I wasn't too familiar with the area, and I could tell we were pretty much in the ghetto. She finally had me pull over and said, Here is fine. I wasn't exactly sure what house belonged to her so-called friend, because there were a few on the left side of the street. To the right was a cemetery, which was kind of freaky. I waited for her to thank me or say something, anything, and finally get the hell out of my car. But she just sat in the back with an awkward smile on her face. I looked back and asked her if she was waiting for her friend to come out. She quickly said, no, I'm just waiting for my money. I looked at Frank again. We were both stunned by her answer. I wasn't about to let some stranger I just helped talk to me like I owe her something. So I told her I'm not giving her the money, and if she needs help, she can ask her friend. She started getting loud, demanding that I give her the money that I promised her. This shit was crazy, I just wanted that psycho out of my car. I looked out the window, and by this point there were other people in the street and on the sidewalk. I'm not sure if these people just happened to be outside, or if they heard her yelling, or hell, if she had something planned. My mind was racing, I couldn't think straight, and she wouldn't stop. I realized these people outside were getting closer to my car. Then I heard my front door handle try to open. Some man was outside my window yelling, asking what's going on. So I finally just took the 20 out of my wallet and threw it at her. She grabbed it up and instantly left my car, and then took off running. I got out of that neighborhood as fast as I could. When we found the main road, I felt a little better, but I was pissed that I got played by some lady. I didn't even care about the $20 because I already knew I wasn't getting that back. But mark my words, I'll never give another stranger a ride again. Hey guys, it's Moore here and thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed tonight's stories. Please don't forget to go over and check out Killer Orange Cat where you'll find even more content. Please subscribe to him. He's an awesome creator. He's a very good friend of mine. Stay awesome. See you over there.